as we see what Luke has to offer in our Advent journey, I'm going to start off by talking about musicals. Because I have a microphone and I can. Uh, <laughs> I have never been able to decide whether I like musicals or not. They're weird to me. They throw me off. People are like walking down the street or they're about to get in a fight or uh, they're struggling with a big decision. All of a sudden they spontaneously break out into song. It's even worse when it's a duet or a group number and all of a sudden these random people are singing in perfect harmony. It's, it's strange. It, it throws off my, my sense of the story. It just throws off the way I enter into it. And like they're, they're, they're bouncing back and forth and and they're, they're finishing each other's sandwiches, like in that movie with the two princesses that had nothing at all to do with the kids' presentation that we had here last week. Uh, he was doing whatever it is that snowmen do in summer, I think. Um, but anyway, like, it's, it's, it's weird to me out that the people passing by never think that this is weird. They just carry on. In fact, sometimes it seems like it's beneath their notice, or they join in, they're breaking into this spontaneous, synchronized dance number, and like, it, it's like they're possessed. <laughs> I don't know, it's weird. But then they just go about their business, like nothing ever happens. And I suppose a synchronized dance-off, with, you know, syncopated snapping is probably better than actually getting into a fist fight and stay cool. <laughs> but still. Then you have musicals like the Blues Brothers that have some of the most incredible music ever, but it's at least justified in the context. They've still got some of the weird musical cliches going on, but you kind of feel like they're making fun of them. The songs aren't serving the plot. The plot is just there so that they can have their songs and have gigantic car wrecks, which are also cool. Uh, there's still this weird synchronized dancing that goes on. Years and years ago, though, practically in the Stone Ages, there was an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer called <laughs> Once More with Feeling. And the very existence of this episode validates all musicals for me. Uh, it was a musical episode that came out of nowhere. It became the gold standard for musical interludes in otherwise non-musical television shows. And aside from having amazing songs and showcasing surprising vocal quality from the actors, it's cool because it acknowledged the awkwardness of the un and the unexpectedness of these musical breaks. They're like, why are we singing right now? And I laugh. It was like the best curse ever. So why, why do I bring up the musicals? You're, you're ready to find that out now, I think. Because somehow it seems like Luke's Christmas story, his introduction to the adventures of Jesus Christ, is a musical. As we go through it, all of a sudden we have people randomly bursting into song. And it's really impressive. In chapter 1 of Luke's Gospel, we have two separate musical interludes. Uh, Zechariah celebrating the birth of John the Baptist. At this point, of course, he wasn't baptizing anyone. He was John the kid that's going to take a bath soon, and someday we'll be giving other people baths. And that's a really uh, awkward way to put it. But uh, there was also Mary, who was going to be the mother of Jesus. And it's all like, Mary, did you know? Yes. She did. That's, that's what Luke says. Uh, he doesn't even get to the birth story until chapter 2, and the family tree comes in on chapter 3. Chapter 1 is all about the anticipation. It's the anticipation that we've been talking about in Advent, that long buildup, that slow journey that Jesus took as he was entering into the world. And the longing that people had for a Messiah and a Savior that had been promised for thousands of years. Almost a thousand years before Luke wrote, the prophet Isaiah looked forward to that moment. He said, uh, even the wilderness and desert will be glad in those days. The wasteland will rejoice and blossom with spring crocuses. So, like, we're already, we're looking forward to John the Baptist here, out in the wilderness, spreading that good news. It says, yes, there will be an abundance of flowers and singing and joy. The deserts will become as green as the mountains of Lebanon, as lovely as Mount Carmel or the plain of Sharon. There the Lord will display his glory, the splendor of God. And he did, right? That's, as, as we're getting into the, the John the Baptist, Jesus transition story, Jesus goes out into the wilderness, he's baptized there, and God reveals his glory, saying, this is my son. So Isaiah goes on to say, with this news, strengthen those who have tired hands, and encourage those who have weak knees. 
Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong and do not fear. For your God is coming to destroy your enemies. He is coming to save you. He's speaking into that longing of Advent. The ones who are waiting and have gotten exhausted from waiting. Their hands are tired from holding on. They can't walk and say, be strong, hold on. It's going to happen. And Isaiah says, when he comes... He will open the eyes of the blind and unplug the ears of the deaf. The lame will leap like deer, and those who cannot speak will sing for joy. These are the signs that Jesus offered back to John the Baptist to say, I am, yes, indeed, who you thought I was, who you said I was. These are the signs that Jesus repeated as he was reading his very first public reading of Scripture. Did you catch what else there? Twice in six verses, Isaiah says that singing will surround the Messiah. Maybe Matthew isn't the only prophecy geek writing here. Twice in the very first chapter of Luke, we get people breaking out of this song. The impression I get as I read through all the ways that the gospel writers decided to introduce people to Jesus is that they all had different priorities in mind. The people that they were writing to had different needs, and the writers had different things that they felt were important. Do you ever feel that way? Like, there are things that leap out to you and you can't understand why everyone else isn't just right there with you? Or there are things that seem super obvious to you that you just can't understand why anybody would be so ignorant as to disagree. That's awesome. That's that's part of being the church. That's part of being the body of Christ. Honestly, I would be a little bit worried if everyone around me was agreeing with everything I said or all the beliefs that I hold. First, because having our ideas challenged helps us to have a healthy grasp of what we believe, and it ultimately strengthens our faith. It gives us the security of knowing why we believe what we believe. The second thing I think is even more important, though. Being surrounded by a diverse set of passions and experiences and the lenses that we bring to important issues of faith and life Well, that helps us to have a fuller and more rounded understanding of them. As much as I get excited about the way I see something, and just like to put out there that that way is obviously right, a lot of the time, I'm only seeing one side of something that is very, very complex. That's why I love the fact that we have four tellings of the adventures of Jesus Christ in our Bible. And they are all slightly different, and they are all inspired by God. In our first message of this Advent Adventure series, we looked at how John introduced Jesus to his readers. John was a theology geek, or at least he became one. He was passionate about the nature of God and who God was, and that that supernatural understanding of Jesus Christ that that talked about Jesus' kind of DNA. He said right from the beginning, Jesus was God down to his very DNA, even before the beginning, Jesus was God. Matthew was a prophecy geek. He wanted to tell people about who Jesus was in terms of Israel's big God story that had been told for thousands of years. How how Jesus was the Messiah that they waited all this time for. And when when he set out to introduce people to Jesus, he talked about Jesus' family tree and how it fit into Israel's history and how at just the right time, Jesus stepped into their story. So as they're setting the stage for Jesus, John starts before time. Matthew places Jesus in history. And Luke gets personal. Here's how he opens up. We're we're starting off our, our journey through, rapid journey through Luke's gospel here. It says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us from those who were first eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. Love that. Love that. Luke was a doctor and a historian. He might have played bass, too. I don't know. Luke 
had a really keen eye for the human condition. So when he wrote his history, he rooted it in people's stories. Right? When you read Luke's Adventures of Jesus Christ, you get the feeling that the people he talks about are real people who have real struggles, the same struggles and doubts and ambitions and expectations that we do. And Jesus just comes barging into the picture and upsets a whole lot of apple carts. I feel like for Luke, he felt the best way to explain something was to tell a story about it. Luke, more than any of the other Gospels, he, he gets a sense of the people around Jesus as he makes his way into the world. I really like Luke as I imagine him to be. I like how he's concerned with the truth. He's being careful. He wants to get it right, sifting through all these crazy Jesus stories that must have been floating around to get to what really happened. So how does he do that? He tracks down that, those stories to their eyewitnesses, to the ones who told them first, the ones who saw it for themselves and were transformed by it. While Matthew and John start off with this kind of heady intellectual stuff, Luke starts out with people. He puts us into their worlds and introduces us to their, their expectations, the things that they're waiting for. And then he immediately shows how those expectations were wrong. The amazing thing about the heroes of Luke's introduction, our, kind of, our stand-ins in this narrative, is how they react when those expectations go unmet. So Luke is, is done his preamble here. We know he's out to offer this real deal story. Here comes the setting. He opens up with a time. It happened in the days of Herod the Great. We know that Herod the Great was the ruler of Palestine from about 37 BC until he died in 4 AD. So Luke is giving a very specific, verifiable period that we're entering into. Then he brings in his first characters, Zechariah and Elizabeth. He tells us a bit about them. He gives uh, some family tree, once again, verifiable. He tells us that Zechariah is a priest uh, of a certain order and uh, in a certain uh, schedule and all those things, verifiable. He tells us that both Elizabeth and Zechariah are blameless in how they follow the law, and then he throws a curveball that we might not catch. They're childless because Elizabeth can't have children. I mean, you probably catch that. It's, it's, it's pretty blatant in, in the narrative. But maybe not how those two things go together. We've talked before here about how people at that time and in that place believed that blessings and curses were directly related to how well someone followed God's law. But here are Zach and Liz, and they're doing everything perfectly, and God still has not given them a child. They're very old, it says, very old. I don't know exactly how old very is. I don't know if it's as old as anybody in this room, but they're very old. <laughs> and I don't know if you know how biology works, but they did, and they knew that the window of opportunity had passed. Still, it seems like they had kept praying. So man, I, we could do this whole thing right now on holding on to hope and persistent prayer, but we're not there today. I'm still talking about weird musicals. I'm going to get there. Stick with me. So here we've got Zechariah the priest, and Luke tells us that he's in his temple doing his appointed priestly things, and boom! An angel appears, and Zechariah freaks out a bit. He's all shaky, because of course it is. he is. Like, you would be shaky, too, if, if an angel appeared and started talking to you. Sometimes I wonder if this gets a bit annoying to the angels, because every time it's like, poof! Ah! They're like, oh, sigh. Don't be afraid. Every single time. I'm just a quick aside here. Uh, this is why I get a bit skeptical when someone comes to me and tells me an angel told them something, and I'm like, well, what was this angel like? And they invariably say, well, it was some sort of warm, comforting presence. I say, no. <laughs> Angels are scary. It's in the Bible. I'm going to move on, move on. So the angel knows that Zechariah has been praying for a child forever and gives him the best news ever. He's going to have a son. And this long-awaited son is going to be a huge, important part of the coming of the long-awaited Messiah. 
He even gives that kid a name. The angel gets to name the kid John. How cool is that? So you'd expect that this is the place that the first musical number is going to come in, right? He's going to get excited. He's going to jump for joy. There's going to be singing and dancing. And a chorus of other priests are going to come in spinning menorahs or something like that. No. Zechariah says to terrifying angel man, prove it. How is that for guts? And terrifying angel man is, of course, not impressed. And so now not only does Zechariah not get to sing for joy, he doesn't even get to talk until after the kid's born. He goes home, sure enough, Elizabeth gets pregnant. But does she celebrate? No. Luke says she stayed in seclusion for five months. As much as they've been praying for God to work a miracle, they don't really expect God to work that miracle. When he comes through, they can't accept it. They, they hold back from hope. It kind of feels like a weird way for Luke to start off his Jesus adventure. Why does he consider this story to be so important as he's setting the stage for his telling of this good news? The thing I find is that as you go and read through, you find this reaction is echoed throughout the gospel and even beyond. I mean, Luke begins his gospel with the same anticipation and longing and expectation that God's people had for their Messiah. They've been waiting and hoping and praying for so long. The question that Luke is preparing their minds for here is how are you going to receive this unexpected and joyful, and maybe even a bit scary news. Can you take it if the promised Savior is coming in a different way than you thought he would? <coughs> is hope going to be too much to accept? Do you ever feel like that? Like something's too good to be true? Like you've made this journey to a point of acceptance. You've gone through the denial and the anger and the bargaining and the sadness and you're done. I mean, you might give lip service to the idea that there's still hope, but real hope means moving back to that tender place where hope kind of hurts. It's like when your eyes get used to the dark, and you can kind of see well enough to get around, but then someone flicks on the lights, and you're like, ah, turn it off! Hope can be like that. Sometimes I wonder if that's the point that God's people were at after their Advent season had lasted thousands of years. I mean, imagine waiting for something that your 42 times great-grandfather had been promised. And it hasn't come through yet. It's hard enough dealing with someone for just like over a couple of months or a couple of years being like, yeah, the check must have gotten lost in the mail. You know, I had something come up, it was really important, but I promise you are next on the list. My kid got sick again, and I just wasn't able to get to the post office. At some point, you kind of just write it off, right? Like, you still hear them saying it's coming, but you don't really believe it. So it's interesting that it's only at the point where Elizabeth has accepted and embraced this miraculous, long-awaited answer to prayer and come out of her seclusion that the angel appears to Mary. And the angel's like, Hi, you're awesome. God loves you. And so she's like, ah! She's completely freaked out. And the angel's like, sigh. Don't be afraid. And then the angel gives her an even more impossible message than she, the angel gave Zechariah. This isn't like a, a things are going to work when they really shouldn't work. This is a something is going to happen that is completely and utterly impossible message. Mary's going to be pregnant with no male involvement and give birth to a son. And this one gets a name too, Jesus, Yeshua, which means God saves. Not only that, but he would be the Messiah. Finally, thousands of years in the making, now's the time. Talk about a double whammy. She, she knows that this is impossible. She, she says so. But this time, instead of shutting her mouth... The angel points to the miracle that God is already working. He points to her cousin, Elizabeth. So how would you react to that? I know how I tend to react when I hear about something awesome that God is doing. Somewhere, something like this. 
That's great, God. I know you are awesome and all-powerful, and I, I'm so glad that I can know that you're working in the world. But you don't really do that here, do you? I mean, we hear stories about God doing amazing works right now. He's multiplying his church, transforming lives in incredible ways. And we're like, that's great. But do we really believe that he'll do an amazing work here, in this area, in this place? Well, that might be a little too much light. And we believe he does it. We believe that it's happening, but the idea that he'll do an amazing work here, I'm not sure we want that hope. And we can see now. Let's not push it. I'm not sure I can handle another year of disappointment. Is that a narrative that ever goes through your head? Well, the heart of Mary's response to the angel is why not here too? Why not here too? The angel says no promise for God is impossible. So Mary says yes to God. What's her first move? She packs her bags and heads for Elizabeth. She believes it. If this is where God is working, she wants to be there. She takes that step in faith. She doesn't wait another like three or four months to see if there's word in the family newsletter, if, if, if there's a new baby cousin. She puts on a pack and she hauls it for hill country. And when she gets there, she finds God waiting. Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit and she says in a loud voice, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Blessed is the one who believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises. Even when it seemed hard. Even when they'd been waiting forever and it hadn't happened. Even when everything about it seemed impossible. Blessed. So now we finally get to our first musical break. How do we know it's a song? I mean, there's not a whole lot of rhyme going on. There's not a whole lot of rhythm in any way. Uh, there's no notes on the page. What we've got here is a translation of a translation. Mary wouldn't have been singing to God in English. She wouldn't even have been singing to God in Greek. She would have been singing in Hebrew, but we don't have that anywhere. It was never recorded, to the best of our knowledge. We, we, we don't have any historical record of what it looked like right at the beginning when it was first written down as it was handed to people those first eyewitnesses. What we do have is the Old Testament, including all of the psalms and other musical interludes that are translated into Greek. So we have Hebrew Old Testament translated into Greek. Why is that important? We can now know what Hebrew songs look like in Greek. So they went back, as, as, as the translators, the, the really smart people that figured this stuff out so I can learn about it, uh, look at this. They say, this is a Hebrew song translated into Greek. This is how it looks when a Hebrew song is translated into Greek. And what we have here is a really good Hebrew song. Have you ever tried to write a song? I mean, like, or have you ever tried to write poetry? It's tough. For the most part, it, it's something you work on for days or weeks or months. And you block up and stuff isn't it flowing right. And, you know, it's hard to find the words. Beyond that, have you ever read poetry written by a teenager? <laughs> I've read my own teenage poetry, and I feel lucky because it was written on paper and I can burn it. <laughs> I feel bad for the kids posting their stuff online because that's there forever. They're never going to be able to live it down. I mean, there's only so many times someone can rhyme rain and pain before it loses all meaning. <laughs> But here's teenage Mary in this pure musical moment. It's good. She bursts out in this spontaneous song that will live for thousands of years. We call it the Magnificat. We actually sang a version of it here a couple weeks ago. So 
we move on, and, and three months later, Luke said, three months later, John has come, or at least the baby has come, and Elizabeth and Zechariah go to the temple. Only John isn't John yet, and Zechariah still can't talk. So the people in charge decide they're going to do him a solid. They're going to name the kid after his father, little Zechariah, Zechariah Jr. And Elizabeth objects, of course, because she knows what the angel said, and, and she's on board with this miracle. But, of course, she is a, a woman, so no one will listen to her. It takes Zechariah actually writing it out on a little tablet for them to accept it. But in that act of faithfulness, as Zechariah claims this promise, beyond accepting the physical miracle that's taken place, but he's embracing everything else, the rest of the promise that the angel had given, everything that's wrapped up in that name John, this child will prepare the way for the Lord. It is in that moment, in that casting aside of the damaged expectations, the hurt of the long journey, the hoarding of hope, that his tongue is loose and the song begins again. He sings this awesome song about how the promise of God's salvation, a promise with a thousand step journey is finally coming true. The rising sun, he sings, the rising sun will come from heaven, he sings, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, and it will guide them in peace. He says the light of hope is going to shine. For everyone that has accepted that darkness is all that they really have to look forward to, God is again saying, let there be light. What's God saying to you? When expectations go unmet, it hurts. When promises fall through, there's a special kind of pain. As children, it can throw us into a tantrum. As adults, often we kind of form a bit of a callus over top of it. We get to the point where we stop expecting, because expectation leads to more hurt. We don't want the light of hope because it hurts our eyes. What Lou shows in his introduction, as he sets the stage for Jesus to enter the story, as he prepares for Christmas, is that God is most honored when we take him at his word and take a step of faith. So as we close today, as we approach the end of this year's Advent journey, I want to encourage you to search your heart. Is there something that God's been calling you to that you've been holding back from? What's holding you back? The same God that made a couple long past their childbearing years be parents to a prophet. The same God who made an unwed virgin the mother of God in the skin is still at work today. It's the same God then and now. It's the same God there and here. And he's calling you to take a step. Even if the light is blinding, even if you can't see where it goes, he's calling Take the next step. Let's take those next steps together. Right? We'll be singing when we get there. It'll be spontaneous. They'll be snapping. It's going to be great. And we'll have to pray for some ability to dance, probably. But God has done unlikelier things. Greater things are yet to come. The light is. Let's pray.